I'm Mike Brilla, host of the Inspired Teacher Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking with Rolanda Baldwin. She is Vice President of Mathematics at Unbound Ed. Our focus today is helping students learn math. Awesome talk. So much to learn. And and by the way, before you go, it'd be so cool if you helped out the podcast. How could you do that? Glad you asked. Well, here are three ways. Uh, One is you could tell a friend, share links, or how about go to my website and leave a review and subscribe, or how about this? Click on the link on my website homepage that says buy me a coffee, and by doing this, you could donate a dollar or two to help me address the costs associated with producing the podcast. What do you think? That'd be so cool. You are awesome. Enjoy the show. I was like, okay, let me understand the pattern. Let me understand what's happening here. Why why are students struggling with the um, math in middle school? It's the education podcast, your favorite show with lots of groovy guests and they share what they know. So crank it up to 10 and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah. With Rolanda Baldwin has worked in mathematics education for nearly two decades as a middle and high school math teacher, a math instructional coach, and a math curriculum coordinator at Guilford County Schools in North Carolina. She began her career at Unbound Ed as a math specialist before transitioning to the math director role. As vice president of mathematics, Rolanda coordinates development across all Unbound Ed math, science, and Unbound Ed planning process, or UPP, programs. Rolanda also contributes to organizational strategy, cross-functional work work streams, and external partnerships. She is passionate about everyone being a math person and is committed to influencing the systems and structures to support educators in providing grade-level, engaging, affirming, and meaningful math instruction. Our focus is Unbound Ed and working with students and mathematics. Rolanda, thanks so much for being on the show and say hi to everyone. Hello, very happy to be here. Well, glad to have you here, and uh, you're Vice President of Mathematics for Unbounded. Let's start by talking about your interest in mathematics. Uh, where did that come from? Uh, what do you like most about math? Um, I have always loved math. Um, I don't ever remember a time when I didn't love math. And just as a student, it just came very naturally to me. Um, I was very good at mimicking procedures that the teacher demonstrated. And it just made sense to me. And then even within my home life, we just, I feel like my family, we just always had a mathematical approach to things. We just liked figuring things out and seeing patterns. So um, as I matriculated through K-12 and began and actually started being challenged in math, so like around pre-calculus, um, it actually became a challenge to me. It just wasn't something easy for me to do. Um, I actually started liking math for different reasons. Um, I loved it because I saw it as a tool that I could use to just analyze the world around me and also to make production I mean, predictions. And then I loved I could use it to prove ideas and to make decisions. So I think this is still my my favorite thing about math, just its utility um, in my everyday life. And just it really helps me to understand the world around me. That's awesome. And you're talking to someone who I was interested in math and I went through Calc 2 and I stopped at Calc 2. <laughs> um, and, you know, there was a, 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 a I, I was a history major, all right? I was a history teacher, okay. all right? And I, I, I um, was a history, high school history teacher for, for nine years. And uh, what's funny is I married a, a math major who she has a master's in stats and, and I have two sons who are both engineers and I'm the history guy. <laughs> and they, 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 I used to joke with them and say, hey, guys, I can help you with that math. And they'd go, yeah, right, Dad. Hey, Mom. But you know, you know? <laughs> that's actually a nice combination because the study of history is really understanding patterns of human behavior. And we learn from those patterns. And if we can apply what we learn today, then history won't repeat itself in, in bad ways. I like that. I like so that. Thank you very much. There is a connection there. Very much so. Nice. All right. All right. So now you were a middle and high school math teacher during your career. Could you talk about the challenges that middle school students face the most when learning math? Yes. So um, I would add that I came to be a middle school math teacher um, in a non-traditional way. Um, I actually 
uh, my training is in engineering and I worked as an engineer uh, for about eight years before I began to teach. So um, the way I came, so when I started teaching, I started teaching uh, middle school math and um, it was just very shocking to me. (laughs) see uh what the challenges were because i never struggled in middle school math but um again me being the analog analytical person that i am i was like okay let me understand the pattern let me understand what's happening here why why are students struggling with the um, math in middle school and i came to the conclusion one of the challenges is the transfer from in elementary school you're really focusing on additive and multiplicative reasoning and then when you get to middle school you start I'm focusing in on proportional reasoning. So you're comparing um, the relationships between connected quantities. You're just not looking at one quantity and comparing that to another quantity. You're actually looking at a relationship between two quantities and then comparing it to a relationship between two other quantities. So that's definitely um, a challenge for students. And then on top of that, you, you factor in the hormones, the different social constructs. Like it's, it's just, um, it's a challenge in time. And one thing that encourages students to push through that challenge in time is having a positive math identity. So I think in middle school, um, confidence is really a big thing. And if students have not developed that positive math identity prior to coming to middle school, um, if they don't see themselves as legitimate doers of math, then that combination of transition and proportional reasoning, the social changes, the hormonal changes, it just, um, it can really be challenging and it can really be daunting. That's so right. I can only imagine because, you know, first of all, I got to say thank you for teaching middle schoolers because there's a reason why I taught high schoolers. All right. This, you know, whew, um, but the, uh, you know, and it, my favorite high schoolers were 10th graders. 10th graders were awesome. They were, I like 11th graders. Those are, those are my two right there. Ninth, uh, <laughs> you know, and 12th. Oh, forget them. All right. They're, <laughs> they know too They've much. They've already you know. checked out. Yeah, exactly. You know, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, that. That's awesome. And there is so much going on in their world. That's why I wanted to ask you about that, because there's so much going on. Plus, on top of that, you're going to talk to them about math and uh, and figuring it out and, and wanting to, to care about it, which I think is is awesome to have conversations around. So, all right. So let's focus about who you work for now. Um, it's called okay. Un- Unbound Ed. Uh, what's its mm-hmm. purpose? So at Unbound Ed, we are focused on dismantling the, those educational practices that cause the predictability of student outcomes by race, language, and socioeconomic status. So we ground our work in the intersection of standards, content, aligned curriculum, and equity. And that is really essential. Um, we've been talking about the opportunity gap, the achievement gap for decades. But one thing that I think is unique to Unbound Ed's approach is that we sit at the intersection. A lot of people are experts in equity. People are experts in standards and content. But we understand that we have to combine those in order to really move the needle. So we believe that we can disrupt these patterns of predictability by providing um, what we call our GLEAM framework, which is grade level, engaging, affirming, and meaningful instruction. And the way that we promote this or push this out into the edusphere, as our CEO likes to say, um, we equip educators to to do this through our four-day standards institutes, where we bring educators together all across the nation to really um, dive in for four days to just kind of plan, to learn, to plan, and to move forward so that we can disrupt this predictability. And we also have two-day local summits where we can come into your context and do this work for two days. Or we even have uh, multi-touch programs. We talked, I talked, I alluded earlier to math identity. Um, One of our multi-touch programs is the Math Leader Collaborative, where we can have school and district leaders, whether they have a positive math identity or not, to come together and really learn how to plan and what it takes to um, support an environment where GLEAM math construction instruction can happen. That's excellent. I I appreciate you talking about that um, because we're going to be talking a little bit more about math here in just a minute and and uh, making some reference there. And and with Unbound Ed, you are the uh, you know you're the vice president of mathematics. I mean, tell us what you do. So first of all, I lead an amazing team 
of um of of lifetime educators, lifetime learners that develop all of our math, science, and unbounded planning process um, programs. And as a leader of this team, this involves me working with my team to develop the vision and the trajectory of our programs. Um, we like to stay informed with the developments and research that are happening in the field. Um, we visit classrooms um, to see what's actually happening on the front lines. And, over, and we use that as action research. I also speak at conferences. Um, I give keynotes. Um, and uh, in the words that I often tell my team, I'm basically leading a revolution, um, a math revolution <laughs> in the education, in the K-12 education space. Very nice. Very nice. Very <laughs> cool. So, uh, all right. So let's let's jump into talking a little bit about some of the challenges and, and things that happen in math. All right. So, what are some of the most common barriers that kids are facing in learning math? What do you think? Um, a lot of times when that question comes up, a lot of people point to these technical uh, challenges such as unfinished learning, such as not um, having basic concepts. But I really think um, that it's deeper than that. And one place that I like to start is that it's um, one of the challenges is a fixed mindset. There's a fixed mindset that either you are a math person or you are not math, not a math person. But even when I was in the classroom on the first day of school, I would tell my students, we are all math people. You are all math people. If you don't love math right now, you're going to love it by the time you get to the end of the year after experiencing a year with me. Um, I think another challenge. So once we get past that fixed mindset of whether people are math uh people or not math people. Another challenge is that a lot of times when people choose, particularly in the secondary environment where teachers choose to teach math, um, a lot of times we're drawn to math because it's something that came natural to us. So, so we kind of have an idea in our head of like, what is this ideal math student? What do they, what do they look like? What do they, what kind of actions do they take? What do they sound like? And this causes sometimes for us to put people in a box. Um, so students aren't necessarily given the space to show up as their authentic selves and also be a good math student. So kind of disrupting um, those constraints. And then I think there's a disconnect between math, school math and real life math. Um, I know a lot of adults who are professionals doing amazing things in their fields, and they will be quick to say, I'm not a math person. But then I have a conversation with them about the types of things that they're doing at work. And I'm like, you do realize this is math. You're talking math. You're doing math. And they're like, oh, no, this is exciting. It's not that boring school math. So we really have to just make that connection um, between the two and not see those as separate entities. And in doing that, we're really disrupting how we see math. I think a lot of times, particularly here in the United States, we see math as like this regimented uh, procedures that you have to follow in order to be successful to get this, you know, perfect answer. Um, and that's where the emphasis is. But I like to think of math as a way of just noticing the world around you, noticing what those patterns are, making generalizations about those patterns and then applying those generalizations to the other things that we see in the world around us so that we can solve problems, so we can understand our world better, so we can make our world better. So those are some of the common barriers that I see. Oh, I like that. Thank you for sharing. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, especially, you know, if you get that stuck in your mind that, oh, I can't do math or, uh, you know, it's, it's not my thing or something like this. I mean, even just something as simple as hanging, the kids you hang around who, you know, if it's, mm -hmm. it's something they like to do or they have some interest in it or there's some thought about down the road type thing and math's important to it, you know, so that you, uh, you know, when you sit at lunch or something like this, you start talking, that's helpful because, I mean, I, I think sometimes if you surround yourself with friends who say the opposite, which is that, who, who needs math? You know, we, we, math, that's bad, man. We had, yeah. Um, exactly. And it's, it's crazy how just some of those things we have to <laughs> have to address as, as educators. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of, one of the things I gotta, I gotta talk about here is that, uh, um, you know, when teachers are working with kids, you know, one of the things that uh, they're going to run into is trying to figure out those types of, uh, you know, strategies that might uh, work to help, uh, you know, 
work kids into the idea of that this is good stuff. I mean, so you know, what's, uh, what are some of those most important strategies teachers can use to ensure that math instruction is, is you know, on grade level, engaging, affirming, meaningful? I mean, what are some of those strategies you like to get them working with? I'm so glad you asked that. I love answering this question. Um, Like I said before, a lot of times when we see insurmountable problems, our first approach is a very technical approach. But again, this is an adaptive issue. And I think it's important for teachers to begin, first of all, with just understanding their own math identity, understanding how what their experience was in their in K-12 and how they um have come to identify what is math success, what is not math success. So if they understand um, their own math identity, it really helps them to understand why they show up in front of students the way that they show up and what their expectations are. And once they understand their math identity, I think um, we need to make sure they deeply understand the content that they teach. Uh, as I said before, many teachers are drawn to math because they they just are really good at it. They understood the, and understand the procedures, but sometimes we have to go deeper than that. I often tell people, I didn't truly understand math until I had to teach it. Even though I had an engineering degree, even though I worked in the automotive industry, even though I worked in IT, I feel like I truly understood the content that I was teaching. I pushed myself to do that so that I could reach my students. And as you're learning and having that deep understanding of the content, um, it's very important that teachers learn to build a community of learners within their classrooms where you really leverage the students' funds of knowledge and use that as a bridge to the content knowledge. So when I say students' funds of knowledge, I'm talking about the things they learn just by existing in their families, just by existing in their communities. And a lot of times we disregard that knowledge and we kind of see students as coming to the classroom with a blank slate, but that knowledge can definitely be leveraged and used as a bridge to connect to that academic knowledge that they are learning, that grade level knowledge. And that is how we affirm um, the students that are with us. And in order to engage the students, to give them access to those grade level standards, we have to leverage the coherence that's within the standards. The math standards were built to be coherent. And if we leverage that, we can give just in time supports. I remember as a child, I even remember when I first began teaching, how you just kind of spent the first few months of school just reviewing what you did last year. And I call that just in case supports where you make these assumptions that students aren't coming with certain things. So you feel obligated to reteach everything. So then when you get to the point where you're actually teaching grade level standards, you don't have time to go into the depth that you need to go into because you've spent a good chunk of the beginning of the year reviewing last year's curriculum. So that creates that cycle where students never catch up to grade level. So that's how we can engage by providing those just in time supports, not seeing math as being linear, but kind of seeing it more as a net. And so as a net, like there are certain parts of the net you have to shore up, but it doesn't mean that that net can't hold anything. And then um, I think as you understand the content more deeply, another way that you can engage students is to provide multiple entry points and connect those to conceptual understanding. So when you're giving students problems and tasks, um, a lot of times, I know when I grew up in math, like you had to do it the way the teacher did it, no exceptions or it was wrong, but just being open to students um, engaging in math problems in a way that makes sense for them. And then when you see the multiple ways that students are engaging in that problem as the facilitator of learning in that classroom, you can make those connections of how those different methods all connect to each other. And that helps build conceptual understanding for all of the students in the class. That's so cool. I, you know, it's one of the things that uh, I was always fascinated with math. It's just that I took another direction. All right. And but the. Uh, at the, but at the same time, you know, as I can remember struggling at one point when I was in 10th grade and I was uh, taking geometry and um, we got focused on theorems, all right? And I was like, theorems, my goodness, what is this all about, all right? Well, one of the problems that we had a friend of the family who was a, a steel building contractor and he built steel buildings and he said, hey, I want you to come with me to the job site. And so I went with him to the job site after school one day when I was in the subject that we were struggling on. 
that I was struggling on. And uh, he showed me, he said, he, he, he was showing me how he lays out a, the flooring for a building, the foundation, and uh, before he starts putting up the sides. And, and all of a sudden, my light bulbs went off. It went, ah, <laughs> oh, that's what they're talking about. Now I get it. And it was that cool sort of reality of how it's used that made my brain suddenly start going, oh, now I get this. And geometry started becoming something kind of cool and easier. And But the coolness is what popped in when I started realizing that it's used for other things than, you know, theory. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's what I was talking about before when I was saying connecting school math to what happens in the real world. And that connects to the meaningful piece within our Glean, Glean framework, seeing how math is used in the real world and more than just seeing how it's used in the real world. But um, you felt empowered after you saw that connection, you felt empowered. And that's what our meaningful um, element is tied to students feeling empowered to see math as a tool to actually help them within their context, with, to help them within their life, even to help them to advocate for themselves, um, to help them to see the agency that they have and the power that they have um, to use math as a tool to better their lives. I love that. It's, there's so much, you know, it's, Unfortunately, there's a popular thing in the air, which is to make fun of math, you know, mm-hmm. you know, from comedians to, you know, movies to whatever. And, you know, when do I use this? I, yeah, the bell rings and I stop and I do this, that and the other. And it's like, well, yeah, don't shoo, go away. That's because you know, <laughs> it is all around us. And it is something that uh, um, if you understand how it's being used to either create the things that we have <laughs> that uh, down to that little, little little bit of a millimeter, whatever you want to talk to, you know, just uh, from the, sh- you know, the, how our engines work to, you know, whatever our shelves in our office are put together. So. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. But, yeah. Oh, I love it. Good stuff. All right. So uh, you keep talking about this math identity. So let's, let's go into that for just a minute. All right. Okay. So what's one small step educators can do today to help their students develop a positive math identity? Okay. Well, I alluded to, I guess, step zero um, earlier, uh, teachers understanding their own math identity. Um, This is a practice that we take our participants through, whether they're leaders, whether they're math teachers. um, And you just see so many light bulbs go off when they understand why they see math the way that they do. Um, And it, it really influences their expectations of students and how they approach. So once you understand your own math identity, then you can understand the importance of developing a positive math identity for your students. So now that you've got to that, I would say the first, so step one for a small step is just to reframe. This opens you up to reframe deficit thinking. Um, So that gives you the opportunity to make space for multiple for students showing their competency in different ways um, to remove that rigidity and um, for space for students to show up as their authentic selves. Um, And that goes also connects back to what I said earlier about deeply understanding the content and also building a community with other math teachers around you. So a lot of times teachers may not accept different types of answers from students because they don't necessarily want to be caught on the spot. Like, okay, if a student says this, I really don't know how to respond. So that's when you take advantage of the collaborative planning time that you have to work with other teachers so that you can talk through different ways that students might approach problems they practice um okay how how do i respond when a student approaches it this way how do i connect this approach to an approach a a different approach to build that conceptual understanding so just opening it up for students to express themselves and to um see themselves as valid uh doers of mathematics helps to build a positive math identity in students that's so cool. I mean, it, it's, you know, because I, I think there's so much <laughs> negativism that it's just being able to say, you know, not only can you do this, we're going to have fun doing this. And, you know, this is, uh, there's some cool things there. And it's, you know, it's, uh, and usually within schools, there's different organizations like the math clubs or um, mm-hmm. this activity, like the robotics or something that utilizes mathematics that they can see that uh, how it works and fun they can have with it which is 
Really, yes, absolutely. Really cool stuff there. I, I like that. I, all right. So yeah, we're coming to a close. We're getting close to finishing up here, Rolanda. Um, where can our listeners find additional information, connect, and learn more? Of course, they can follow, follow Unbound Ed on all of the social media uh, platforms at this Unbound EDU is um, on Instagram, X, Facebook, also LinkedIn. And if you want to follow me personally, I am on X as at Row Knows Math. Very nice. I will have that information in the show notes so it's easy for people to follow. Mm-hmm. And connect with you. So good stuff. I got two last questions for you before you go. Okay. And these are just questions I like to ask my guests. And the first one goes like this. Uh, when things become overwhelming or too much is going on, how do you push back uh, that feeling to want to quit? Uh, great question. Um, especially in this day and time with so much going on um, within the education profession as well as just in the world uh in general just um and let's say an exciting time to be alive um but i have to revisit my why i have to go back to my why um i chose to leave engineering and come into education so that i could make a difference in children's lives so i have to um go back and revisit that i have to tap into my source of strength and recognize that this work is my god-given purpose so this is what keeps me going, um, even when things are discouraging. Love that. Awesome advice. And uh, everyone listening, yeah, that's, that's good stuff right there. All right. So thank you. Uh, last question for you, Rolanda. It goes like this. Do you have a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it? And what would you say if given the chance to say thank you? Yes, I've had, I've fortunately had um, a lot of amazing teachers in my life. Um, But when you ask this question, there's one teacher that pops into my mind. And it was my fourth grade teacher, uh, Mrs. Houston. And um, as a fourth grade student, I've always been kind of a very mild mannered, uh, even shy person. People who know me now laugh when I say I'm shy um, (laughs) because it's something I've kind of um, learned to mask very well. Um, (laughs) But I was a shy, quiet student that just kind of, you know, was stayed under the radar. Um, I did. You know, I did well. I made pretty good grades. Um, So I thought I was killing it. I thought I was killing it. I was making good grades, having good behavior. And Miss Houston kept challenging me. She kept saying, you can do better. You can do even better. And I'm just, and of course, my first response was like, I'm doing okay now. Like, what's the problem? Um, But she continued to push me. And um, because she was relentless. And so I continued to push myself. And I saw my full, full potential. And I just, I will have to say, I've never stopped. I have um, continued to operate in excellence um, ever since then. So um, if I had to say something to her today, I would say thank you for not letting me stay up under the radar. Like, thank you for seeing the light in me. Um, And it's that thing that Um, As an educator, even though I'm not in the classroom anymore, um, but as I influence those who still are working very closely with students, you just don't know who's sitting in your class. You don't know who's sitting in your building. Um, And it could just be that extra push that sends them to greatness. So, yes. Thank you, Ms. Houston. That is awesome. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing. Rolanda, thank you so much for talking with us about Unbound Ed. It's programs and ideas for addressing the needs of students who struggle with mathematics. Excellent focus. Wishing the best in all you do. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right here. The opinions expressed on Teaching Learning Leading K-12 are those of the guests and host. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.